In this video, we would be covering the topic of small for gestational age fetus. First, we will define what is considered an SGA fetus, followed by the classification, etiology, complications, investigations, and concluding with the management. A small for gestational age fetus, also known as SGA fetus, is one whose estimated fetal weight or abdominal circumference is less than 10th percentile of that expected for that gestational age. The diagnosis can only be confidently made in accurately dated pregnancies. The incident of true FGR is about 5% in the general obstetric population. An SGA fetus can either be truly growth restricted, also known as fetal growth restriction, FGR, or constitutionally small. 20% of SGA fetuses are constitutionally small. While FGR can be classified into two types, symmetrical and asymmetrical FGR, based on relative size of head to the abdomen. Symmetrical FGR is when all organs are proportionately small. The fetal head circumference to abdominal circumference ratio is within normal range. 40% of FGR are of this type. This is usually the type of FGR seen in those resulting from intrinsic factors. Constitutionally small fetuses are also usually symmetrically small. On the other hand, asymmetrical FGR is a result of relatively greater decrease in abdomen size compared to head size. The abdomen will be smaller because of a smaller liver volume compared to the relatively unaffected brain size, and hence HC to AC ratio is higher than the expected range. This pattern of FGR is the commonest form resulting from extrinsic factors affecting growth support. The asymmetry results from fetal adaptation to inadequate growth support by redistributing blood flow preferably to vital organs such as the brain and heart at the expense of non-vital organs such as kidneys and the abdominal viscera. The etiology of SGA can be categorized into extrinsic and intrinsic factors. Extrinsic factors which refer to factors that affect supply of nutrients and oxygen. These include decreased uteroplacental blood flow, such as hypertensive diseases, chronic renal disease and collagen vascular disease, chronic hypoxemia such as chronic pulmonary disease and cyanotic heart disease, chronic nutritional deficiency, autoimmune disease, drugs and toxins such as cigarette smoking, substance abuse, anti-convulsant, anti-neoplastic agents. Other extrinsic factors include primary placental problem and multiple pregnancy. On the other hand, intrinsic factors refer to factors that affect growth potential such as chromosomal abnormalities, congenital syndromic abnormalities, and intrauterine transplacental infections such as toxoplasma, varicella zoster, malaria, rubella, and cytomegalovirus. FGR is one of the leading causes of perinatal morbidity and mortality. It is important to identify the FGR fetus because there is an inverse relationship between the birth weight percentile and adverse perinatal outcome. The greatest risk is when the weight is below the third percentile for gestational age. Fetuses with FGR due to intrinsic fetal causes generally have poorer prognosis because of the etiological factors, such as chromosomal abnormalities and intrauterine infection which lead to poor growth potential. 
FGR resulting from uteral placental insufficiency, which is similar to poor growth support, if unrecognized, may lead to intrauterine death or hypoxic neurological damage to the fetus. Hence, the aim of management is to deliver the baby before metabolic acidosis sets in from uncompensated hypoxia. The challenge is to continue conservative management until adequate fetal maturity is achieved. There is increasing evidence that FGR babies have increased risks of chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension when they reach adulthood. While the constitutionally small baby also has a slightly increased risk of perinatal complications. So how is the diagnosis made? Clinical assessment. Clinical assessment and suspicion is important, especially in the presence of one or more predisposing factors. Even in low-risk pregnancies, clinical assessment is the important starting point. The most important prerequisite is an accurate assessment of gestational age because normal and abnormal fetal size is diagnosed on the basis of gestational age. Early establishment of gestational age through dating ultrasound scan early in pregnancy is imperative for all pregnancies. Another clinical method is by using symphysis fundal height measurements also known as SFH. SFH refers to the measurement of the distance between the upper edge of the pubic symphysis and the top of the uterine fundus using a tape measure, which is a simple and inexpensive clinical tool. After 24 weeks of gestational age, the SFH in centimeters roughly corresponds to the gestational age. Discordance is suspected when it is more than 3 cm from that expected for the gestational age. This method performs best when the same clinician does all the serial measurements. While the sensitivity of SFH measurement is not particularly high in the detection of SGA fetus, it performs better than plain abdominal palpation alone. Ultrasound Assessment Serial measurements of growth measures on ultrasound using parameters such as abdominal circumference, AC, and head circumference, HC, allow for definitive diagnosis of FGR. A routine screening ultrasound scan is usually performed at around 20 and 28 weeks, although no real evidence exists that supports the role of routine third trimester scans in the detection and improvement of outcome in SGA fetuses. Whenever clinical suspicion of FGR is present, ultrasound assessment of fetal growth is important. Prenatal diagnosis is wholly based on ultrasonographic detection of small fetal size. The most important ultrasound parameter is the fetal abdominal circumference, which is an indirect estimate of fetal liver size and glycogen storage. While fetal weight can be roughly estimated by using formulae that incorporate fetal abdominal circumference, head circumference, and femur length. Ultrasound diagnosis of SGA fetus is made when either the estimated fetal weight or the fetal AC is less than 10th centile expected for that gestational age which can be assessed by using available growth curves. Once a diagnosis of FGR is made, the most important issue is to distinguish the constitutionally small fetus from those with FGR. A constitutionally small fetus achieves its normal growth potential and has a good prognosis, whereas the fetus whose growth potential is restricted is at increased risk of perinatal morbidity and mortality. FGR resulting from intrinsic fetal factors such as aneuploidy, congenital malformations, and fetal infection carries a guarded prognosis that often cannot be improved by any intervention. 
FGR resulting from uteral placental insufficiency has a better prognosis if delivered at an optimum gestation. Initial assessment should be targeted to identify a cause, such as a detailed fetal anomaly scan to look for structural abnormality, karyotyping by amniocentesis of fetal blood sampling, an infection screen of maternal blood to check for seroconversion for cytomegalovirus, toxoplasma, and rubella. In absence of an identifiable cause and in presence of a predisposing factor such as hypertensive disease, renal disease, autoimmune disease, thrombophilic disorder, the most likely cause for FGR is uteral placental insufficiency. In these cases, effort should focus on identification of symptoms and signs associated with chronic fetal hypoxia. These symptoms include decreased fetal movement, which may be associated with chronic fetal hypoxia. Signs can be evaluated on Doppler velocimetry, assessment of amniotic fluid volume, and on the cardiotocography, CTG. Once FGR is diagnosed by clinical and ultrasound examination, fetal growth should be accessed by fetal biometry every two to three weeks. Fetal well-being should be assessed by daily fetal movement chart and weekly or twice-weekly AFI, Doppler velocimetry, and CTG. The frequency of assessment depends on the severity of FGR. The essence of management of the FGR fetus is optimum timing of delivery before the fetus develops metabolic acidosis. The mode of delivery is determined by using obstetric considerations and the degree of urgency of delivery. Antenatal corticosteroids for enhancing lung maturity should be administered for FGR fetus who might need delivery prior to 34 weeks. Between 26 to 29 weeks of gestation, each day in utero has been estimated to improve survival by 1 to 2%. In FGR fetus before 34 weeks of gestation, evidence of normal umbilical artery flow by Doppler velocimetry is reassuring with regard to immediate fetal outcome. Prolongation of pregnancy to gain further fetal maturity is reasonable in these cases. Prior to 28 weeks, the decision to deliver should be taken with due consideration of neonatal intensive care facilities and after carefully discussing the options with the couple. Normal venous dopplers might allow continuation of pregnancy for a few days even when umbilical artery dopplers show absent or reversed EDF. For pregnancies beyond 28 weeks, reversed EDF in umbilical artery or an abnormal CTG is an indication to deliver. For pregnancies beyond 34 weeks, absent EDF in umbilical artery is an indication to deliver. Between 34 to 37 weeks, elevated umbilical artery RI or SD ratio especially in presence of oligohydramnios, is an indication to deliver. In presence of normal fetal assessment parameters, the FGR fetus or constitutionally small fetus should be delivered once it reaches 37 to 38 weeks. Quiz time! Question 1. Approximately how many percent of small for gestational age fetuses fall into the intrauterine growth restricted group. Question 2. Which of the following studies 
is the most important in assessing a growth-restricted fetus at 32 weeks of pregnancy. Question 3. All of the following features can be assessed during the first trimester scan except